Hi, everybody, and welcome to day 24 of my 30-day Facebook Live Language Facilitation Challenge. Today's video topic is animals, intuition, and language facilitation. And so in this video, I'm going to tell you four ways that nonverbal kids or late talkers communicate in the same way that animals communicate. I'm also going to tell you the same basic psychological principles behind learning any new skill, whether it's animals or um, kids. And I'm also going to tell you the difference between training and teaching, at least in my opinion. And then I'm also going to tell you five fun ways to use animals in language facilitation. And I see that Alexandria is here today. So glad you're here with me. And if you're catching this on the replay, I'm also glad you're here. My name is Marcy Melzer, and I am an intuitive speech language pathologist, and I help parents teach their late talking kids how to use the words they need to share their wisdom with the world. And I do that with my waves of communication, language facilitation, parent coaching program. So let's get into today's topic, talking about animals. I personally love animals, and I know that a lot of families have animals too. So, um, and, and there's a really good ways to use animals with language facilitation. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is the ways that animals communicate the same way as nonverbal or late talking kids or late talking kids communicate the same way as animals. So the first way is they use behavior. Obviously, um, if a child isn't using words and they're using behavior like grabbing you to take you to things or pointing or gestures or even just facial expressions, things like that, those are behaviors and certainly animals use their behavior to communicate with you. In fact, that's the number one way that we kind of know what's going on with our animals. If they're acting very excited or if they go to the door when they want to go out or, you know, you, you, that's how you're understanding at least what your animals are communicating is by their behavior. And same with kids. The second way that animals and kids communicate the same is through sound patterns. So I have two cats and cats communicate with each other using different kinds of sounds than they do actually communicating with humans. At least my cats have, and that's something that I'm sure that I think I read. But my cats, when they're upset or angry, they'll use a kind of noise. And when they're excited and wanting to eat, they'll be a brighter meow, meow. Um, and, you know, that's sort of cat language, but of course it's not language. It's just different sound patterns that they're using. Sometimes um, some cats even have whole kinds of conversations with people. <laughs> you know making all different kinds of sound patterns with their speed with their you know noises that they make um birds particularly communicate with sound patterns uh, very specific sound patterns that have special meanings so that's almost like bird language because they actually you know do understand those meanings but sound patterns and then kids also use sound patterns when they don't have access to words so it might be a screaming sound pattern it might be a mama mama it might be a ha, 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 ha. you know those kinds of things obviously those aren't words or even necessarily behaviors but they are sound patterns and they do have meaning communication meaning so that's another way that animals and kids communicate the same is with sound patterns and then um, the next way is with their eyes so um, those kids most late talkers actually do have really good eye communication, eye contact, eye connection with parents on their terms. So you'll see late talkers give that, you know, I've talked about it before in my videos, that, that eye gaze like, I know that you understand what I'm talking about here, you know what I mean, you know what I want, you know what I feel. Um, and I think animals do the same. Uh, certainly my cats do, and I had a dog, and I have had parrots, and you know, all the different animals that I've seen, even when I've been at zoos or at the aquarium even. Sometimes I'll just, you know, I'll get on, uh, the turtles will give you a look in their eye. I don't know that they, I don't know. Somehow they're communicating with their eyes. Maybe even it's the eye posture. Um, you know, that squinty eye look. 
or that bright eye look, you know, that's the facial expression. And I know in animals they don't have the same level of facial expression as people, but kids definitely use their eyes and their facial expressions to communicate. You definitely can tell how a child feels by watching their face. Anybody, actually. I mean, you can see even in your coworker or your spouse or your partner, if they're like looking you know, dejected face looking, you can get the idea of how they're feeling without their communicating. Those nonverbal ways of communicating, animals use them too, I think. So kids and, and um, animals both use facial expression and their eyes and the, to communicate. And then the last way that nonverbal kids and animals use to communicate similarly is via touch. So it's no surprise that um, a, a child who wants your attention is going to come and, you know, if they're yelling at you and that doesn't work, they're going to come and get you. They're going to come touch you. They're going to whatever. And, and one of the things that I coach parents is when you know you want to get your child's attention, if you just touch them, even if you just touch their arm or touch their leg, that sometimes gets their attention. And I know that my cats get my attention if they want to be fed or they want, you know, I'll get a paw on my cheek or on my face or on my lap or whatever. And then, um, you know, my one cat, especially her communication behavior for I want a treat is to rub up against my legs. So um, animals and kids both communicate via touch. So that was four different ways that humans, late talking kids and animals communicate in similar ways. All right, so the next thing I'm going to talk to you about in this video, and I see that Joshua's here and Nikki's here. Thanks for joining me today on this topic of animals, intuition, and language facilitation. And that intuition part is actually about, similarly to what I talked about with the facial expression part, is, you know, just understanding those things intuitively, we sort of know what our animals want. Um, Obviously, our animals are not using language, but I know even at the aquarium, you get to know an animal that you spend a lot of time with. And the aquarists that work with the manatees and turtles and sharks and on all those animals, they really do understand that those animals have their own personalities and their own preferences and their own ways to communicate when they're happy and when they're, you know, discontented. So I think that, you know, getting to know your child and knowing your child, you as a parent, really understand all of those other things that they're doing. And there is some intuitive level of communication there. Um, definitely with pets and animals that you know. But even if you approach an animal or an animal approaches you and it doesn't feel safe, like a dog or something like that, you know, you can almost get a feeling about the behavior of that dog like whoa you know and i'm sure that it comes from their posture and whatever but you know i think if you really dig down you are using your intuition to communicate with animals too all right so the next thing is about training and teaching and how training and teaching animals and training and teaching children or even adults or even how we learn they all operate on, you know, when you're doing the training, the same sort of psychological foundational principle, and that is called operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is basically, in a nutshell, um, using some kind of reinforcement to either continue a behavior or eliminate a behavior. And so it's called operant conditioning, and that's the system that they use to train the animals at the aquarium. It's the same system that professionals use to train animals that are in live shows and things like that at SeaWorld and, and, and um, uh, Bush Gardens and you know all those places, Disney. And um, it also is the same principle that we use in our language facilitation strategies, whether you think about it or not, because it really is all about the reinforcement. And there's different kinds of reinforcement. There's positive reinforcement, and that's typically used when you want to see a behavior again. You want to positively reinforce that behavior. And if it's a behavior that is a negative, behavior there is a way to negatively reinforce that behavior 
but unfortunately negative reinforcement it hasn't been proven to be sustaining so that's where the next tip I'm going to talk to you about is the difference between training and teaching and the best way that I can do is it's based on the reinforcement system that you use so in a training scenario you may use a negative reinforcement or the withholding of the positive reinforcement which in itself is a negative reinforcement so for teaching animals that that would be the case of beating an animal into stopping barking. So if a dog is incessantly barking and you and you hit the dog with a newspaper or spray it with a spray bottle or any kind of deterrent kind of reinforcement, that may stop that behavior, but it does nothing to teach a replacement behavior. Um, and, and teaching a replacement behavior requires a positive reinforcement. But when you teach a positive behavior and you withhold the reinforcement until the behavior is achieved, that in itself, the attempt of trying is just, is, is, not, pos is not a positive experience. So in humans or in late talking kids, the training equivalent of, you know, a negative reinforcement like a spray bottle or a newspaper or something like that to stop a dog from barking would be in the circumstance of like ABA therapy where you're training a child to not run, you know, not be a wandering learner, to teach them to be a sitting learner. Um, and so if your child is naturally exploring but you're teaching them to sit and they have to sit in their chair for a certain period of time before they can get that reward, usually that reward is a tangible thing, a treat, a cookie, or an ability to get up from the chair, which isn't even necessarily teaching that skill as something that's important. And that's the difference between training and teaching. When you train a child or train an animal, you are teaching skills, um, either to start a skill or to stop a skill. And when you are teaching a child or an animal, you are teaching, I see we got a like about that, and when you are teaching a an animal or a child you are instilling a skill that is intrinsically useful for that child or animal so in the case of the dog barking you would train the dog when they're barking to be able to uh, come and sit down or learn to be calm and when the dog is calm you're gonna help them be calm and when the dog is calm you're gonna give them a positive reward and it's not even necessarily in teaching a positive a, a tangible thing it doesn't even necessarily have to be a tangible thing because if you're teaching a skill that meets the need of that child or person then just the intrinsic ability to have that skill and use that skill is the thing that is reinforcing so training is going to be teaching your child to say this word when I hold up this say pen when I hold up this say you know hand touch your nose wave your hand those kinds of things and and in therapies like ABA therapy you're teaching kids to do skills or tricks or um, procedures or behaviors and not teaching the skill that you actually need to be successful in the circumstance of the of the purpose sorry nose itching somebody must be thinking about me um, so so that's the difference between training and teaching so I see that there's some likes about that and and it, what's really important in your language facilitation journey is that you are using the um, you are using your teaching time as teaching skills that are important for your child and if your child is receiving therapy from someone else then you're going to want to know that the skills that are being taught to your child during that during that therapy 
should be teaching, should be tangible, useful things and not necessarily behaviors or whatever. Now I know that some some therapies say that they require beginning skills in order to develop things, but if your child already has the the oral motor structures to be able to say words, then you should be working with words. You know, you should be teaching the kinds of skills that your child can use. And you shouldn't have to use a reinforcer like a candy or a treat or a chocolate or something like that because you're teaching them skills that they can use. Um, and those skills are going to be useful and helpful for them. And then they're going to want to keep using them over and over again. And that in itself is more rewarding than a cookie or a treat because that's a fleeting thing. And a, a behavior is a fleeting thing. But a learned skill is something that is, you know, intrinsic, that you get to keep and that you get to use forever. So thanks, Alexandria says yes. And Brianna is here. Hi, Brianna says happy Thursday. Happy Thursday to everybody who's joining me. We just had a big hoedown here, a little talk. I Oh, my nose is just itching. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, my uh, We just talked about how some the difference between training and teaching. So now with the fun part of this video is I'm going to teach you the fun ways to use animals to help you with language facilitation, real animals. So we compared kids with animals at the, up until now, but now I'm going to teach you how to use them. So if you have um, any, the, the very beginning, in fact, one of the first recommendations I have for families if your kids aren't verbal at all is to practice with animal sounds. And this is something you can start doing as young as 12 months old. Um, you know, if you're looking at books or videos or even the animals in your house, in fact, both of my kids, their first word was not mama, it was cat or kitty because we had two kitties and our kids and our girls loved our kitties. So the, the first thing that you can teach kids is animal sounds and work with the farm animals and work with the, the jungle animals and, and all the different sounds that they make. So even a, a horse, for example, horse is kind of a tricky one for little kids. So sometimes um, instead of saying nay or yay or something like that, I'll go, you know, and, and teaching those skills that, that noise or the oink oink noise or the moo or wee, wee, wee. all those different noises are excellent oral motor practice. A good chance for you to start to use your mouth to say sounds that are trickly very close to speech sounds. I mean moo is M-O-O. -O. Moo. You get to practice two different speech sounds just by saying one animal sound. So animal sounds are the best way, number one favorite way to get started using animals in language facilitation. And Jack loves to make the elephant sound excellent. All of those noises, all those animals are great. In fact, one of my language facilitator moms has 41 different animals her little guy knew the sounds for before he knew the names for them. And so, uh, you know, like I said, animal sounds is a good way to start. And then the second way, of course, is animal names, you know, the animal sound, the cow says moo, the sheep says ba, the snake says S, all that. Um, and then the second way to use animals is to observe them. So observe them in books. Make look to know that cows are different colors, dogs are different colors and shapes and sizes. Um, and when you go to the zoo or the petting zoo or any place like that, observe the animal's behavior. See what colors they are. See if they're hairy or not. You know, make comments and talk about the animals. All of those are fabulous opportunities to help develop and facilitate language. All right, so the next experience, the ne experience is the next thing. The next tip is to experience animals, touch animals. If you go to petting zoos every fall here in the United States, we have Halloween in October, and usually by the end of September to the through October, that's the best time to go to a petting zoo, or the pumpkin patches often have farm animals and things like that. And petting zoos are an amazing way for language facilitation because not only do you get to see the animals, but you touch them and you smell them and you see them poop and you see them eat and you get to actually watch and experience what animals behavior is and talk about all those things and talk about, wow, the animal eats 
you know, maybe a sheep is eating grass. Do you eat grass? No. Um, those are amazing ways to use animals as experience. So get out and touch them. If you go to the aquarium, touch the touch the urchins and touch the starfish and, and touch the sharks. Like at, at the aquarium where I volunteer, kids can touch those things and we can even, you can even touch a shark egg at our aquarium. All those different things are really important for you to have experiences with animals. And then the next way to get really great language facilitation with animals is to care for them. So if you have pets, then it's really important that you get your kids involved in their care so that you understand that dogs eat, not just occasionally, but every single day dogs have to eat. Dogs have to go outside and go potty every single day, multiple times a day. And and you know other animals too they have to be fed every day watered every day brushed groomed take them to the groomer train them you know if you're and and then that's the next thing is that you can train them so in your animals that you have at home this is the best way to facilitate language is that you get your kids involved in your animals training so they're the ones that are giving them the command sit um, you know, now animals, their training, like I said, the animals that are super, super smart are the ones that you've actually taught to use skills. So the dogs that know how to open the door to go out by themselves, you know, that's an amazing skill. You don't even have to take them out into the yard. If they know how to operate their doggy door, you, you've taught them a skill that actually benefits them and you don't even have to be involved. That's teaching. Training is dog sits by the door with their leash waiting for you, you know, while you're getting your boots on to go outside. You know, there's just those differences and the and we it's important that we train our animals. It's important that they know how to live in our world, in our environment. And the the skills that they really need for themselves, you'll see that they learn those things even better. And it's the same with your kids. So have your kids help train your animals, help them give the directions. So tell him, sit. Tell him, stay, tell him, wait, you know, all those things, because then you're getting your kids to practice using their words with animals as well. So those are, that's my video for today about animals, intuition and language facilitation and training and teaching and all of that stuff. And I hope that you've enjoyed it. We're really wrapping up these 30 day videos that, you know, the topics keep coming to me and it's been super fun to share all this with you. If you want to catch any of the videos in my 30 day challenge, they're all on my YouTube channel and the link will be in the description of this video. Um, and um, you can also, if you want to work with me, you can reach out to me via my website, wavesofcommunication.com or my Facebook page here or my personal Facebook page, you can send me a, um, you can send me a private message and we can talk more about the Waves of Communication program and how I have been able to help parents, every single parent in the program has started to use words within the first week. And they are firm language facilitators within the first three to six weeks and see their kids using words consistently within that period of time. It's the most amazing progress I've ever been able to help families get and I hope that I can help you do the same if you have a late talking child. So please feel free to reach out for me. Thank you for liking and viewing all of my 30 day videos. They've had such a wonderful response. I've been so pleased and please share them with anybody you know who you think could benefit from any of the videos on my 30 day challenge. Check out all the topics on the YouTube channel and share them with your friends so that we can get as many parents as possible on this language facilitation journey, getting their kids starting to use quickly themselves, naturally and via these ma marvelous teaching methods in our Waves of Communication program. So until tomorrow, everybody, for my next episode in my 30 day challenge, I'll say good afternoon and have great language facilitation. I'll see you tomorrow.